just wondering back to this manuscript. Here it is. Uh, first slide, please. Uh, this is uh, Mount Altissimo, and this is going to be uh, one of the two protagonists of my talk tonight. The other protagonist is be Michelangelo, and I'm going to try to tie up these uh, two protagonists. This is uh, a mountain of marble in Pietrasanta, about uh, two miles from Carrara, two miles from the sea. And uh, I have to stand here, but uh, I didn't realize that. It's uh, about a mile high, and it presents itself as a vertical rampart. Uh, there's about a half a mile of marble behind it, and it opens up to the sea. It faces the uh, Tyrrhenian Sea like a Greek temple. Sometimes, if you're way out on a ship, it will appear like a, uh, like a, with a silver glow. So for centuries, I mean for thousands of years, it was perfectly obvious to everyone that this was a mountain of marble. Um, those little holes you see in there are actually are the caves that people started uh, digging in about 500 years ago. And now the whole thing, those uh, razor-sharp lines are what are called centieries. Uh, that's where the uh, marble quarry workers walked up. And uh, now the whole mountain is sort of excavated out. And the center, uh, right under the summit there, is excavated to a point when you go in, it looks like Grand Central Station. It's of that kind of dimension. But more like a cathedral, that would be a better description, because actually the holes connect up. And um, on the right-hand side there, you see that white peak? That's a, that's a uh, modern quarry. And in that technique, the mountain is cut down from the top. <clears throat> well, when Michelangelo came here about uh, 500 years ago, this was a raw mountain, and his assignment from the Medici was to get marble from this mountain. It was around 1518, and um, his, it was a major undertaking. He had to fight the mountain, battle the mountain for two years. And while he was engaged in putting in a road to the sea, choosing the quarries, and uh, having all the problems of a entrepreneur, he had to live under this aesthetic image, a very powerful aesthetic image. And when his, um, he found the first sculptures he did uh, after this experience there of two years were the four prisoners that are now in the Academia in Florence. And I would like to connect the four prisoners <coughs> in the Academia in Florence with this Mount Altissimo and try to show that there is a thematic, that this is my theme, that there is a connection between the mountain and these four prisoners. Uh, the basis of my uh, uh, supposition that the four prisoners come from this period is uh, our letters and uh, one of the major art historians from Columbia, Howard Hibbert, said uh, that in 1519, this was the basis of the conception of the four prisoners comes from 1519. And that's exactly when Michelangelo was uh, in Pietra Santa working on Mount Altissimo. Uh, another theme I'm going to say is, uh, is that this was a pivotal period that uh, most writers felt that these two years he spent here were wasted years in quarrying. But I think that what changed in him uh, will show that it was a pivotal period in which he had a breakthrough from classicism into expressionism. Uh, and he almost paralleled modern, modern aesthetics of uh, the 19th and 20th century. Um, let's see now how this works. I'm going, to, I'm going to give you just a tiny bit of background uh, to show, you know, a little art history here. In uh, 1516, Michelangelo had just completed the Sistine ceiling and was engaged in a new project. The Julius tomb. 
a huge pyramid that was to go um, in St. Peter's Basilica. It was a pyramid with many life-size figures. Unfortunately, Pope Julius died before the tomb really took off, and all that was done were the two figures in the Louvre and the Moses. So when the new pope came, it was a Medici pope, Leo X, and he immediately put Michelangelo on a Medici project, which was the facade of San Lorenzo. This is another, another close-up of Altissimo. And here's the facade of San Lorenzo. Um, he was to create, this was the family church in uh, Florence, and it was still unfinished. The inside was uh, by Brunelleschi, the architecture was by Brunelleschi, and it had already sculptured by Donatello. So Michelangelo uh, would have been with the two founders of the Florentine Bar. And he was anxious to do this project uh, because it also gave him an opportunity to uh, show that he was an architect. The Pope Julius tomb, now I just want you to get that straight, the Della Rovera project, the Pope Julius tomb, was put on the back burner and he was now free to work more on the San Lorenzo project. So he closed up his house in Rome and went to Carrara. This, oh, this was the model for the San Lorenzo facade. Uh, it's a classical facade in uh, Renaissance style, the new Renaissance style with 28 sculptures, a very uh, big undertaking. And here is Carrara. Now, um, I said that the mines of Carrara, the mines and quarries were very ancient, dating from Roman times. The trails leading down into gorges of loose scrap stone were Dante's model for the Purgatorio. Dante actually lived in Carrara for two years, and he saw a landscape like this. It's very interesting when you find that out. The Duke of Carrara was so happy to see Michelangelo that he, he, he probably stayed in the very apartments that Dante had. Uh, the town itself was very jubilant when he came because he was the biggest marble purchaser uh, in Italy. And they said they welcomed, uh, welcomed him as a sailor coming from Galilee. Uh, Michelangelo roamed the quarries here, and this is his favorite quarry. This is the Polvaccio Quarry, where uh, he probably got the marble for the Pieta in Rome and other, but this was his favorite. And that white area is a statuario, a very rare marble. Uh, it comes like that in the center of the mountain. And um, the story is it cannot be cut out because the marble will collapse, the mountain will collapse. But that's what, that's what it looks like when you see statuary marble. Um, he made drawings of each block. And um, then it was like putting together a big jigsaw puzzle. Later on, all the blocks would be assembled at the site and um, it would be like a, a kind of Chinese puzzle. Then, at this point, everything was going well because the machinery was in place. The, uh, you know, Carrara was made for this. He'd always worked there. All his contacts were there. Then, something very bad happened. Uh, the Medici abruptly ordered him to stop all work in Carrara and instead to use the marble coming from their newly acquired mountains in Pietrasanta. It was a short distance away. Only a ridge, one mountain ridge, separates Carrara from Pietrasanta. A ridge that will look like this. But, Nicolant, but on the other side, it was a primitive area. There were no uh, roads. There were no, uh, there was no labor. And Carrarese would never work outside of Carrara. Uh, it was like a city-state mentality, so they were, there was nothing there. It was just raw country. Um, but it did have rare marble, statuary marble, in warm tints, which was considered very rare to have a warm tint on a marble, or a flesh tint. And uh, it was right near the summit. So uh, the Medici decided to undertake this challenge, and they used Michelangelo for their purposes. Now, 
then I'll show you a few shots of a uh, little travel log here. This is, uh, I was going to leave this out, but I know you want to see this, so, you know, it's like a, this is Petrosanta, and uh, we're looking at it from the mountain, and uh, now we're looking at it the other way. And you see the wall up there is from about a thousand medieval wall. But this is a this is a Medici town, and all that implies is is wealth, beautiful architecture, fountains, piazzas. You know, it's just you can feel it. It says you go to other towns, you don't you just uh, you don't have this kind of thing. Now here you have one cathedral from 1300, which is in the Pisan style. Right over those mountains, these are like the foothills of the Carrara Mountains. Right over there, you start the quarries. These are like just the soft hills. Now let's see. And this this is the Tuscan uh, Cathedral. And this was also about 1300. And there you see the Medici escutcheon above the central portal. And those are very beautiful sculptures there by someone called Stagio Stagi. But they aren't they beautiful? Uh, and now here we're coming back to Altissimo. That was his, uh, this was going to be his great challenge. And there you see it with the uh, updraft clouds. You know, in these mountains, Adrian Stokes wrote about this. He said that there's something about marble that, uh, you know, holds the moisture. And it creates a, a kind of updraft from the valley. So we always see clouds hanging around the ridges, like eyebrows. They're just always there. They never blow away. They just stay there. And then I think they sort of recede down the valley again. Uh, it's a vertical rampart and uh, creased by forces of energy since the beginning of their creation. But it always has a kind of youthful look. Uh, at the summit, the ridges spin out in a welcoming, like with a welcoming gesture and enclose the valley. At night, let's see. The two ridges I wanted to bring out that it has a kind of uh, almost organic feeling. Here it is when it's very white looking. It glows the glow of silver, and it has a feeling uh, almost of a Greek temple when it faces out to sea. The two ridges extending out from the summit-like arms give it an organic symmetry. It could be a Madonna in wet drapery, and from far away it looks like a bird about to, you know, with uh, wings outspread about to take off. At the base of Altissimo, there's a small opening. This is a, right over here, there's an opening from which a torrent of uh, water spurts out. And this place is called La Pola, the source, right at the base. And it has a very mysterious feeling. The mist and the water and uh, the changes of weather there uh, make it feel like a religious uh, a religious uh, spot. And then lately, uh, they found a lot of burial places there from the Neolithic period. So it's always had that feeling. Well, what struck me as a painter is the flatness of the mountain. Uh, it's not a pyramid. It doesn't give you a kind of a, a sculptural muscle. But it has a kind of metaphysical plane as Madame Blavatsky, I don't know if you know who she is, but she used to talk about the plane as being the space of consciousness. And, uh, and then Malevich picked that up, and a lot of modern painters like Mondrian thought of the plane as the space of consciousness. And uh, I think when you look at this mountain, the mountain confronts you as a plane. Now it's a, so it has a kind of metaphysical feeling, and I think uh, that Michelangelo was, you know, being the most sensitive poetic nature that he was, must have been very sensitive to this, to this experience. Uh, probably when he looked at that play, he saw his own terribility, the force that was very acknowledged already in his own work. Probably uh, he felt that in nature, that he was confronting something that was almost parallel to his own nature. Well, for the next two years, he put in a road, and the road extended. This, this site here where we are is uh, on Mount Altissimo, and uh, it's probably the site where the Vincarella cave was. 
And that other, uh, the other quarry there in the distance is another quarry he started. It has a nice romantic name uh, called Trambi Sarah. And right across the valley was another quarry for uh, Bardilio, bluish gray marble. So he started not one uh, quarry, but many quarries. And uh, the first job was to put a road from here to the sea, because it was from the sea that the marble was uh, loaded onto boats and sailed up the Arno on barges. It was not sailed, but dragged up the Arno on barges. Um, let's see. Now he started, these are the modern roads, but very often the modern roads follow the ancient roads. And very often when you're walking a road, you will see the ancient paving blocks coming through. They're put in vertically. And uh, you can see them, you know, they're worn down, they come up through the riprap. Uh, for the next two years, and instead, instead of, uh, he served as a captain of a marble industry. And he often lived as a worker and slept in a hut near the, mount, near the top of Mount Altissimo. You have to know that he slept there because there's no way you could get down the mountain. You, know, you just had to stay there. In September 15, and he wrote to an assistant saying that the road was almost completed except for some tunnels to be dug out. A large boulder sitting uh, across the road and a few places that needed to be leveled with a pick. And seven months later, he declared that the stone workers he brought from Florence knew nothing about marble quarrying, nor how to pick the blocks, nor how to split them into tricky veins. Lowering a column, one worker had his neck broken when the supporting cable snapped, and the column smashed into chunks and small pieces. And this is what he writes in his letter. All of us who were around came close to losing our lives. And furthermore, a lovely power was lost. Michelangelo <laughs> continued to labor with the persistence of Sisyphus until January of 1520. That's two years. When the Medici, now this is unbelievable what happened next. When the Medici abut, abruptly canceled the San Lorenzo contract and um, the, the sculptor then wrote back bitterly to the Pope's cardinal in charge. I'm going to write, read part of the letter to you because it shows his state of mind. I do not reckon the period of three years wasted in this work. I do not reckon the great insult put to me by being brought here to do work and then not having it taken, then having it taken away from me. And for that reason, I, and for what reason I have not yet learned, I do not reckon my house in Rome, which I left, and, um, and the marbles and furniture and blocked out statues have suffered upwards of 500 ducats. Not taking into account the above things, of the 2,300 ducats that you gave to me, only 500 remain in my possession. And then he proposes to the Pope, to the Vatican, a deal that would uh, ensure that he won't be sued later on. Let the Pope take over the quarries I started with the mentioned marbles that they have that have been excavated, and I will keep the money I have left. Furthermore, I will be completely free. That means free of lawsuits. I have, and then he says, I have decided to have a brief drawn up and send it to the Pope for his signature. So after these uh, three years, this was uh, the great frustration. And uh, I have a picture from this period. It's not a very good portrait, but I call it the 40-year-old failure. That's um, It is a little, that's Michelangelo. It's supposed to be a portrait of Michelangelo. Uh, it is a little known fact that during these lost years, between 1516 and 1520, Michelangelo began the sketches for his most startling and expressive sculpture, sculptural group, exploding with anti-classical distortions. And these are the four prisons. Um, 
And as background, I'll tell you that, that a cardinal from the Della Rova family asked him, now this is the, ba the basis of this in documentation, that a cardinal during all this uh, was going on, in 1518, a Della Rova cardinal asked him for some progress on the papal tomb, on the Julius tomb. This is the other commission. And uh, so then he, then Michelangelo promises them four true sculptures by that summer, matching the slaves in Paris, somewhat matching the slaves in Paris. He, he, uh, he promised it to them for early in the summer of 1519. And uh, within a few months, he progressed so far that he was able to order three, uh, four blocks, he was able to order three stone cutters in uh, Carrara, their names are, and I'm not going to read another letter to you, but he wrote a letter and contracted three stone cutters in Carrara to rough out uh, four big blocks, nine to ten feet high, to be ready by the summer of 1519. So all of this is uh, agrees in terms of time and uh, place. So. Uh, his actual carving of the marble, though, took place in Florence. After the Medici, you know, canceled it, he immediately left um, Pietrasanta and relocated, you know, in in Florence in his studio, and that's where the carving took place. And the great, I think, we're almost ready to change there, uh, change carousels. And when he started carving. The great outdoor studio of Mount Alfisimo never left his imagination. Let's can we change the carousel now? <coughs> so you're saying that the mountain somehow inspired him directly to make it out of the physical? Yes, that's the thing. Is the prisoners called the slaves in certain books? Yeah, they're yes. called prigioni. Uh, in yeah, very often they're called prigioni, meaning prison. But this is, we're just halfway through, just waiting a while. I'm just getting to the uh, details now. light clouds, uh, marble, and, and um, the frustrations that he was facing, all of this was acting on a poetic temperament. So he never forgets this when he starts carving. And don't forget that the, the, the cancellation, the cancellation of the project had already taken place. So clouds rising on, over Altissimo's ridge appear in the awakening prisoner. Now look, this is a how the uh, ridge looks, and here's the awakening prison. This is one of the prisoners. And the negative, the chisel marks here, watch how the chisel marks follow the negative modeling. Very much like a mountain. In the young prisoner, the elbow shielding the face has the breathtaking scale of a mountain with the sketching of the chisel. See how much this looks like, this Povaccio quarry here looks like an abstraction by Michelangelo with the negative uh, modeling, the modeling in the, in the shadows. And the atlas could be a mountain giving birth to a man. The quarrymen themselves could be models for this uh, figure. They were staged in his, in his imagination, and their distorted movements show fear and courage one message, the terribility of the, of the quarry. Uh, I think here it's, it's nice to notice the, the importance of the waistline and the midriff. It's like the horizon line. The above part could be the clouds, and below the uh, waistline is the earth. And the twist uh, is the contrapposto. You see the twist to the right, the left, 
and it's, a com it's already a complex contrapposto, but you can see that it's, uh, it's there. Uh, everything he saw in uh, the mountain seems to have, uh, in some way, influenced his, you see it somewhere in here, the ragged edges, the surprised edges, the gouges, uh, the surprised deep undercuts. These are the kinds of things he saw while he was up there. And you can sort of see, now here's, here's an unfinished face. When you're in Chur Viola, that uh, one of his, one quarry, remember the quarry that you saw that was being cut, and you look towards, Al uh, that's, that's actually supposed to be Michelangelo's cave, uh, but it's a little high, but uh, they say it is, you know. Uh, it looks like, look at how much it looks like a head. See, it looks like an unfinished head. And here, uh, a mountain, and uh, reappears in the mountain of space between his legs. Same kind of lighting, deep gouges. This is also from the Atlas. <coughs> uh, in the young prisoner, the elbow and head, uh, it's like the top of a big pendulum. The pendulum swings from the top and uh, is the fixed point from which the figure, which the fi uh, figure sways. It has the same rhythm as uh, the marble and water cascading down from the quarry. Now here's Altissimo close up. The brush strokes on Altissimo, the modeling of Altissimo, how tactile Glows. Now watch. See, in those days, people polished things, and he was the master of the David, the master of the early Pieta. Everything was brought to a high polish. Everyone wanted that finish. And here, uh, and by the, there are other pieces like this. I mean, there are many other pieces where he has this kind of veiling. Uh, I also think that. That, Mick, that Leonardo da Vinci should be brought in because Leonardo um, loved the sfumato. And that also is that atmosphere in the mountains uh, that you notice in Italy, the moisture that sort of uh, veils the mountains. It's, a, it's the crosshatch, many layers of crosshatch. And here, the, the parallel groove work of the pointer chisel. And uh, look, at, but look at that torsion in Mount Altissimo. How, uh, you see that plane there? <coughs> now, in all four prisoners, there's a battle of mountains and clouds. It is continuous in the Appalachian Alps and is uh, enacted in the play of rough and smooth surfaces. Uh, there, there are, these are the textures made by the chisel and the polishing. Contrast of rough and smooth, <clears throat> deep undercuts pitted against sensual swells. Uh, this is the new, this is all translations, uh, seems to me, of the clouds and the mountains. The smooth, the, uh, I think that Michelangelo here was finding a new kind of handwriting, a new way of handwriting, a personal handwriting that conveyed directly his psychology. Uh, here you see the weather-beaten face of Altissimo. And there you see the awakening slave. You feel the updraft of that. The springing up, that's the clouds. I told you about the updraft. And the, the top of the figure seems to rise up from the bottom and you feel the, the pressure up. And uh, this is the arm. Oh, something didn't drop there. Uh, I want to show you something. Something didn't drop. This is the head. 
The five, it's okay. We just have to uh, skip one. That's a. Uh, there's not a slide. Though. There's no slide. Okay. And there's the head. See how? Uh, I think I'll go backwards on that. Here's the head of the awakening prisoner. In the uh, bearded prisoner, I see two horizon lines. Uh, the one at the uh, shoulders with the head and arm acting as a kind of cloud bank, and then at the knees, and there's another little puff of clouds over there. See how the clouds seem to be part of the mountain. Both of them uh, work together. Here's a big cloud, big heavy cloud, big volume. <coughs> and these heavy clouds uh, have the density of marble. Almost uh, <coughs> you feel that there's a, a center to it. Uh, it, this is uh, more or less in conclusion now. The mountains were, I think, the catalyst that released this new sensibility. They intensified his genius, he was a sensitive person, they disturbed it, and shook up all the former connections and pathways, and then rearranged them. Uh, as you remember, the culmination of San Lorenzo was the cancellation great frustration, and the whole of in three years there turned into a purgatorio. Like Sisyphus, he had been punished by having to push a stone up a mountain for no purpose. This futile labor turned his terribility from the wrath of David into the wail of Job, into a lamentation. Uh, there is a whole new feeling uh, of of really uh, lamentation. The prisoners worked on in Florence for three years after Michelangelo left Capesano were presented then to the Della Rovera family, the heirs to the Pope Julius, in fulfillment of the, of the promise for four figures. They were not in proportion with the earlier two figures. Uh, I think I have pictures of them here. Um, this one, these are both in the Louvre. Michelangelo gave these two sculptures to the Pazzi family because they supported the uh, insurrection of Florence. Uh, they were, they were, uh, so they were. The four figures were rejected because uh, if they were accepted, then the other two would have had to be rejected because the proportion had changed. So the rejected sculpture sat unrevised for 40 years in his studio until he died. And uh, he was not averse to recycling sculptures, so that wasn't the case. You know, he often, you know, he could recycle a sculpture, but he just left them that the way they were. Uh, their origin in Mount Altissimo was completely forgotten. The only one of the earliest documentations was by Cardinal Giulio de' Medici, who was going to Rome to become Pope Clement. But before he left Florence, he paid a visit to uh, Michelangelo and saw these four sculptures and uh, made a description of them uh, that is sort of accurate. You can almost uh, identify the four different poses. Well, because of this, the memory of Pietro Santa is completely erased. And they were considered to be, uh, you know, children of Florence. And after Michelangelo's death, Something uh, after Michelangelo's death, uh, the Prigioni, the prisoners, were then placed in the grotto of the Boboli Gardens by Cosimo de' Medici. And uh, Cosimo was um, definitely an enemy of Michelangelo. He was uh, Michelangelo fought for the uh, <coughs> liberty, the Republic of Florence against 
uh, the Medici, and then uh, they were lost, and Cosima becomes the Duke. So there was definitely, uh, I, wouldn't, I, I would say he was an enemy. Uh, no doubt, spitefully, the Duke buried the figures halfway into the walls of his grotto in the Bogley Gardens. I want to show you the grotto. This is the outside. The grotto was like, was like a make-believe cave. And in his crazy way of thinking, the prisoners made wonderful grotto deities. See the uh, awakening prisoner? The bearded prisoner? For 300 years, connoisseurs did not see that Michelangelo's titans were worthy to be shown in a museum. They could not see what it meant that he allowed the rhythms of his chisel to remain. But in the late 19th and 20th centuries, an avant-garde uh, revolution took place and shocked and shook the Parisian art world with a new aesthetic. Beginning with the early Impressionists and continuing with Cezanne, Van Gogh, Matisse, and Picasso, and others, there came an art, definitely anti-classic, characterized by touch, psychology, and surprises. Uh, he was like, a, this is sort of like an, uh, a plain and um, kind of unfinished painting. Figures breaking out of a block. Figures breaking out of a block. And unfinished figures. You know who that is. Uh, these revolutionists valued the content of psychology over narrative storytelling. In context of the new art experience, Michelangelo's prisoners had new meaning. So in 1905, after all those hundreds of years, they were taken out of the grotto and placed in the Academia of Florence in the same room as the David. <coughs> and this was the archetypical classical ideal, and they were placed there, and uh, it made everyone very, very nervous. I mean, it was very hard to explain, and there have been many explanations. The contrast was shocking, and the conclusions varied. The prisoners were so fresh as to be bewildering. Praises and comparisons of the prisoners with contemporary work in Paris made quite a playground of metaphors. Rodin hailed them as finished masterpieces. A favorite comparison was with Cezanne's Baby, how the distortions and rhythms were similar to Michelangelo's Terribility. Are the prisoners finished masterpieces, as um, Rodin declared, or were they abandoned and uh, accidents? Are they expressions of repressed sexual urges? Do they represent his disgust with popes? Well, it could be, you know, two popes um, constantly nagging him for commissions. But Michelangelo's experience has never been con connected to, uh, his experience on Mount Altissimo has never been connected to the prisoners. But once their history, the history of the prisoners is known, I think one realizes how simply the four torsos connect to the mountains where they were obtained. What we see in the four prisoners are deliberate choices of his imagination. This lamentation, let's see, Monte uh, Altissimo again, not to forget Mount Altissimo. And uh, in Santa Maria, these are later sculptures that were really private. These were not, these were things he was making for himself. And Santa Maria del Fiore Pietà, I think you can see the way the, sum the summit swings just like a quarry from the summit in a zigzag path, like those the Cavatori car on the sides of the mountains. The last Ronganini Pietà, which expresses the pure Jovian lament, starts with the double head of the mother and son fixed in space by, the by a spumato light and plunges down Christ's legs into the valley of darkness, like the veil of marble, the 
that drops from a quarry. I could make, I want to make just one more comparison and um, that's it. It's very interesting to see uh, Valley, you see quarry, you see those etched lines there, and you see how this is uh, the last judgment. Somehow I think it just invaded, the whole quarry experience invaded his imagination. And uh, this is really the end of my theme, that a raw natural experience has a deep effect. Uh, and this, this experience on the mountains, of course, was an aesthetic experience, a very aesthetic experience. So it's not just an experience, it's an aesthetic experience with, fueled by all the conflicts, emotional conflicts that were also going on, but it was a great aesthetic experience and I think it did break through from classicism into the personal handwriting that he developed with the chisel. Um, thank you very much. I